to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 7. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Proverbs. This is our second lesson on this book, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, if you don't have your Bible handy, we want you to take just a moment, locate that there, make sure you've got it with you, because today we're going to open up the Word of God to learn how to be the type of person God wants us to be in using wisdom. Friend, today's lesson, as always, is brought to you by individuals and congregations of the Lord's Church in your area. The church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a question, you'd like to know more about the church, more about worship, the plan of salvation, you'll find people there who'd love to sit down with you, study the Word of God, You'll find people there who are concerned about souls, who are kind and loving, and want nothing more than for you to go to heaven. And so we encourage you to check out the Lord's Church in your area. You won't be disappointed that you did. And friend, in your desire to know more about God's will, God's Word in your life, we want to encourage you to check out our website as well thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access our wide variety of good Bible study material that's all free of charge. We have video lessons of every book in the Old and New Testament and a, a large variety of topical studies, audio lessons, transcripts, written material, a host of other good videos and information as well, and it's all available to you free of charge from our website. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a free media request form. You can receive that instantaneously as a digital download, or if you need a CD or a DVD, we'd be happy to make that available to you free of charge as well. And friend, in the fast-paced world in which we live, where everybody pretty much has a smartphone, we encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app available from the Play Store. That's a great way to study God's Word on the go. Today we're thinking about and continuing our idea of, of practical wisdom for everyday living from the book of Proverbs. In our last lesson, we noticed three themes or three topics that were really important. We thought about what the book of Proverbs says about the fool, what it says about anger, and what it says about drinking, and we looked at some verses that will give us practical advice for everyday living. Now we begin with one of the key figures along with the fool. Another key figure in the book of Proverbs is the lazy man. Proverbs has much to say about the lazy man and his slothful ways and the idea of laziness that will do so much good for our society and for Christians today. What do we know about the lazy man? Kind of a humorous verse, but the lazy man loves his sleep. Look in Proverbs chapter 26, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in Proverbs 26. Look with me, if you would, in verses 14 and 15. As a door turns on its hinges, so does the lazy man on his bed. Now listen to how lazy he is. The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl, and it wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. The lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Listen to that picture. The lazy man 
turns on his bed like a, like a door turning on its hinges. He turns on his bed. That's what he's good at is rolling over and going back to sleep. It's kind of the idea. And when you think about this lazy man, the Bible says, and this is such a, a, a graphic and even humorous idea. Here's how lazy the lazy man is. Now, I want you to picture this with me, okay? We have got a spread on the table. Right out in front of you is the best looking batch of golden fried chicken you've ever laid eyes on. You're hungry, Pavlov's bell is ringing, your mouth's watering, and you reach out and grab the biggest drumstick in that fried chicken you can. And it's just so much to put it back in your, it just wearies you to bring your hand out of the bowl and take a bite out of it. Now friend, if that isn't a graphic idea of laziness, what is? But here's what we know. Lazy man loves his sleep, and the lazy man can't hardly do anything for himself, and he's smarter than 10 men who can answer sensibly. That lazy man is just overtaken with his laziness, and everything wearies him. The only thing he's good at is rolling over and going back to sleep. My friend, those are all graphic images, but they show us the state that this individual, his mindset, his attitude, and the state that he's in. And friend, I wonder sometimes, do we have a problem with laziness today? The Bible teaches in First and Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, the man won't work, neither shall he eat. The Bible teaches that hard work is a good thing, and Christians ought to work hard. But friend, I want to show you something from the Bible. The Bible directly links laziness and some forms of poverty. I'm not saying that every poor person is lazy, but I am saying there's some lazy people who end up in poverty because of their laziness. Look at what the Bible says. Open to Proverbs chapter 10. Pro I want to show you just a couple of verses that link the two. Proverbs chapter 10, listen to what the Bible says in verse number 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes him rich. Now flip over to Proverbs chapter 23, verse number 21. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with right, the drowsy, the sleepy person. Um, Proverbs 10 verse 4, the one who's got a slack hand comes to poverty. The one who's diligent, he's the one who's going to be provided for. And so again, we're not saying every person who is in poverty is lazy, but there are a bunch of lazy people who will end up in poverty because they wouldn't do anything for themselves. Now again, I know there are people who face situations where life happens to them, and God wants us to help and reach out and do good, and I'm all for that. But friend, laziness is a whole different story. People need to be encouraged to work. People need to be encouraged not to be lazy. People don't need to be trained to depend on somebody else to do it and to take care of them. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to work hard. If a man won't work, neither shall he eat. If a man won't take care of his own, he's worse than an infidel and he's denied the faith. Laziness is a serious, serious problem. And the answer of that, of course, is feeling responsible for yourself using your talents and abilities, working hard to the best of your ability to get a leg up in life. But listen to this next verse. What else is the lazy man known for? One of the things the lazy man's known for is his tall tales and his pitiful excuses. Look in Proverbs 22, verse number 13. Notice what the Bible says. The lazy man says, there is a line outside. I will be slain in the streets. Why can't the lazy man go out and work? Uh, you imagine this situation. Fellas lazy, family, friends, somebody says to him, you need to get up, you need to go to work, you need to get a job, and here's his reply. There's a line out there. If I go out there, I'm going to get tore up and slain by that line. Well, really? Or are the... Are the dangers and the problems and the what-ifs in life a good reason just to stay in bed? 
friend, if you're that way, we'd all stay in bed probably. But that's, 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 the idea is not that. There may be problems, there may be challenges, there may be difficulties. There's not a lion out in the street. He's not going to slay you. But if we get in this mentality that something bad could happen or it's better just to stay right here, friend, you don't realize you're already caught in the trap. And so his tall tales and his pitiful excuses won't work. Jesus in Luke chapter 14 verse 18 said, They all with one accord began to make excuses. Instead of making excuses, friend, we just need to not be lazy. We need to work. We need to try hard and do the best we can for ourselves. And so one of the things that we learn from Proverbs is don't be lazy. Work hard. Be diligent, do your best. God is going to take care of His own. Another theme in the book of Proverbs that gives such practical advice and wisdom to God's people is about the friends who we bring into our life. God has not created me to be an island in and of myself. Proverbs 18 verse 1, the man who isolates himself is a fool. Foolish people isolate themselves from God and from everybody else. That's not wise. But at the same time, I need to be very careful the friends that I choose in this life. Let me give you some advice or let's look at some advice together from the book of Proverbs about friends. Number one, don't let your friends influence you for evil. Stand up, be your own man, make your own choices. Don't be a pushover and let your friends influence you for evil. Look in Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 10. Watch what the Bible here says in verse number 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Somebody says, hey, let's go down here and do this immoral thing. Let's go rob this place. Let's go down here and get drunk. Let's go down here and get involved in immorality of, of any kind. You name it. My son, if sinners entice you, don't consent. You know, we say, just say no. And that's the right idea. Just because somebody's trying to entice you, just because you're, you're, they're your friend, doesn't mean you've got to go along and do the things that they do. Stand up for yourself. Be your own person. Make good moral decisions because they're right for you. Don't let somebody else lead you down the wrong path. All right, if I had a top verse about friends in the Bible, this next one is it. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26 says, we've got to choose our friends very carefully. Look at, I love this verse. Look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 26 with me. The Bible says this, the righteous should choose his friends carefully. Why? For the way of the wicked leads them astray. Friend, anytime God says and tells me to, to be careful about something, my ears ought to perk up. The righteous should choose his friends carefully. Why? The way of the wicked leads them astray. Don't choose wicked friends. Don't get, get caught up doing the things they're doing. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Evil companions, evil friends, corrupt good morals. What do we say to our young people today, people trying to obtain godly wisdom and living a good Christian life? Be very careful who you let in your circle of influence. If you're around the wrong type of people, they may influence you for evil. And so young people especially, be very careful who you choose as your friends. Choose somebody who's going to bring you up rather than drag you down. Don't choose somebody who you think just because of the exterior, just because they may be cool in somebody's sight, I need that person. Choose somebody who's going to help you be a better person. All right, then there's a third thing about friends. To have friends, you got to be friendly. Look at what Proverbs says in Proverbs chapter 18. Everybody wants friends. What's a quality you're looking for in a friend? Somebody who's friendly. Look at Proverbs chapter 18. Watch what verse number 24 says. The Bible says this, A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Do you want to be a friend with somebody who's kind of standoffish? Somebody who is not kind or fun or, or good-hearted to be around? No. 
to have friends, be friendly, be kind, be nice, be concerned, be caring, be considerate, be friendly if you want to have friends. And so don't you be your own man. Don't let your friends influence you for evil. Just choose your friends very carefully. And then to have friends, you got to be friendly in and of yourself. And so that's good advice that we find from the book of Proverbs. All right, let me give you another category that the book of Proverbs speaks specifically on, and that is on parenting. What does the book of Proverbs say specifically to parents that'll help us to be good, godly parents and uh, instill wisdom in our kids? Number one, children have got to be taught or trained how to live life correctly. Children don't, nobody wakes up. To, I don't wake up tomorrow knowing how to do something. I, I, don't, I don't wake up knowing something innately without being taught that. I don't know math. I don't know algebra. I don't know science or physics just, just like that. You've got to be taught and you've got to be trained to do that. Children, by their parents, must be taught and trained to live the right life. Look in your Bible. Here's the passage. Open to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 6. The Bible says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from that. Now often, we kind of focus on the latter, but you got to get the first right for the latter to work, right? What is God wanting us to do? Here's, here's the advice to parents today. Your job, your responsibility is to train up your children in the way they should go. Now, friend, please don't take this the wrong way because I do not think children are like dogs. That's not what we're saying here. But have you ever trained a dog? You ever trained an animal? You train a dog to fetch. You train a dog to sit down. You train a dog to... How do you do that? Repetition discipline, reward, by doing something over it, saying the right way yourself, teaching that, going over that, rewarding good behavior, disciplining bad behavior, that, 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 that's a process. Children are not going to just somehow get it if they're not trained. Uh, parents, Bring up your children. That's the same idea, train. Bring up your children in the nurture. Train your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Teaching is the first way of training. Ephesians 6 verse 1, parents bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The parents have the responsibility to teach their children. Deuteronomy 6 verse 1 all the way back to the Pentateuch, to the Torah, to the old law, God taught them to train their children. Put it out in front of you, write it on the doorpost, set it as frontlets on your eyes, everywhere they can see and hear the Word of God. And so teaching is how you train. We want to instruct. We want to set them down and read the Bible. We want to talk to them about life. We want to teach them this is right. Teach them this is wrong. Give them guide. That's the parent's responsibility. But then there's also another way of training. I want to teach. I want to encourage. I want to love. But sometimes and society, <coughs> society doesn't like to hear this. But sometimes discipline is also necessary as a way of training. How do we know that? Well, friend, the Bible says so right out of the book of Proverbs. Open your Bible, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. Listen to what verse number 24 says. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who disciplines him, he who loves him, disciplines him promptly or early. If you spare the rod, you hate the son. Meaning, not that we're going to, child abuse is not the idea. That's never the idea. But the idea of discipline, the idea of correction, the idea of showing them there's consequences to bad actions. We start that early. Discipline is not a bad thing. It's from God. Look in your Bible in Proverbs chapter 19. 
Proverbs chapter 19, verse number 18. Discipline your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. While there's hope, while there's still a chance, while they're in that, that learning phase, before they set in their ways, discipline while there's hope and don't set your heart on his destruction. Look at another verse. Proverbs 23, verses 13 and 14. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with the rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with the rod and deliver his soul from hell. Now, friend, we understand that's not child abuse. That's a spanking. That's discipline. If someone is spanked, someone gets a whooping, that's what God tells us to do. Don't withhold from that. Listen to these words again. If you beat him, he'll not die. You will deliver his soul from hell. And so to give somebody a spanking to discipline them, friend, that's not, that's trying, that's a part of training. That's a part of learning. Along with teaching, one also enacts discipline to help them learn. And so advice to parents is, Children have got to be taught and trained. We want to love, we want to teach, and we want to do what we can to help them in every way. Well, let's talk about another relationship that the book of Proverbs addresses, and that's the relationship of husbands and wives. How can we help our marriages to be better? What wisdom does God give to married couples from the book of Proverbs? Number one, you need to realize the value of a godly, righteous spouse. Look at Proverbs chapter 18, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. A, a, a wife, a husband, somebody can help you through life. Somebody that's going to encourage you, be a good helpmate, help you to grow spiritually, help you with the challenges of life. If you find somebody like that, you found a gem from God. And you need to realize that. You need to, to value that. You need to treat it as something precious. That is not an everyday common thing. That's special that's unique, you need to treat it with value, and you need to treat that with the respect that it deserves. Secondly, and I think this is a big part, in any marriage, trust is one of the big keys to making your marriage work. L look from the example of Proverbs chapter 31. Look in your Bible, if you would, in Proverbs chapter 31. I want you to listen to what the Bible says in verse number 11. This is the virtuous wife, and the Bible says in verse number 11 of this woman, the heart of her husband safely trusts her so he will have no lack of gain. What made their marriage work? What makes marriages work today? You've got to trust each other. Uh, you can't be looking over your shoulder. You can't be wondering. You can't be jealous. All Trust is a big part. I trust that my wife, I trust that my husband, we trust each other in that we're going to work together, help each other. We've got each other's back, and we're going to face the problems of life together. Until, so in, until given a reason, you've got to trust in every way in marriage. And then there's a third piece of advice. Both husbands and wives, if you want to make marriage successful, make it work, do your best not to nag. Do your best not to nag on each other. Look at what the book of Proverbs says. Here's the advice. Proverbs 19. I want you to look with me in verse number 13. The Bible says this. A foolish son is the ruin of his father. Now watch this. And the contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. And friends, that would go both ways. The contentions of a husband be a continual dripping either way. But I want you to think about that, that word picture. 
Imagine this with me. You're laying in bed at night, trying to go to sleep, tired after a long day. The faucet in the sink in the bathroom is dripping, and every time it drips, it goes off like an alarm in your head. You ever been in a situation of something like that? That continual dripping would just grate on your nerves and you couldn't get any rest or peace with that. The contentions, the continual fighting, nagging, belittling, badgering, making fun of, that won't make marriage work. We need to build each other up. We need to encourage each other. We need to help each other. We don't need to nag and belittle and be down on each other all the time, but rather we ought to be an encouragement and a help to one another. And so we hope these principles about mainly relationships that we've thought about today will help each of us to foster the kind of relationships that will make us godly people. We hope this wisdom will help guide us to live better lives and ultimately we hope that it will help us so that one day heaven can be our eternal home. Friend, we ask you today, are you on the road to heaven? Are you right with God? Are you a child of God? If not, why not become one today? Do you believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? No man comes to the Father except by Him, John 14, 6. Would you confess His beautiful name before men? Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Would you repent of every sin and, and turn to God? Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Who does not believe shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. If you're not a Christian, you'd like to learn more about that, contact us, visit the Church of Christ in your area. And friend, we hope next time you'll join with us as we're going to think about a life that has real meaning and purpose from the book of Ecclesiastes. Join us next time as we study God's Word together. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.